welcome everybody. I'm really pleased to have a good audience here. And um, I run Linen, Linen Press, which I can't say tonight. I run <laughs> Linen Press, um, which I've done for 17 years now. Kate is um, one of my interns. I think if I'm more as my assistant and probably somewhere in the audience is Emily and um, Oshi, who also helped me a lot. Um, and tonight we're going to be talking about writing character. And I've, I've picked, or, or yeah, I picked two authors who, for whom this has been an interesting challenge. Margot, Margot McEwig up there, who's both writer and film director. And we took on her, her second novel, almost then, after the birds that never flew. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> and it's interesting because Margot's characters are quite dark, quite troubled. Maybe I should say very dark, very troubled. And you take them through a difficult course, a journey that I won't give the ending away, but it's a dark novel. So I'm hoping you'll be able to tell us a bit about how you make those characters available, interesting, accessible. And I should say right now that it's about twins. Marco and I share twins in families, so twins, yeah. is, twins are very <laughs> dominant. Um, so I'll be asking you about that too. Um, so two novels, Susan, Susan there, Susan Clegg, we picked up her, her debut novel, The Dolphin, that came in unsolicited, um, as did Margot's. And I loved the way, Mar uh, the way Susan wrote about three generations post-war and the constraints and restraints on them, the way the characters were almost lidded. They had lids on them that they couldn't, they couldn't get out of their boxes. And particularly the the elder character, Larry Lambert, who founds and builds the pub, which names the novel The Dolphin. Um, I'll let you talk about that, Susan, but it's a beautiful, sensitive portrayal of Larry, who is gay uh, in 1937, and who really capitulates and marries the extremely bitter Rosemary. And I'm interested in how you came up with, and maybe the audience will be, how you came up with such a difficult, bitter, really rather nasty character in his wife, Rosemary. Uh, we stay with her through the novel. Mm -hmm. We don't not want to read about her, but she's, she, she's hard. And I hope you'll talk about that a bit too. So there's masses to talk about. I mean, writing character is just so fundamental. It's such so, so much um one of the first building bricks of um writing a novel. So what I want to ask you both first <laughs> is do you think do you think of your novels as character driven? And what does that mean? Because I see it often in reviews that this is a character driven novel. Um what isn't a character driven novel? Um and what, what do you mean by that? So, do you want to start, Marco? Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for, for coming along tonight. really appreciate it. Um, so for me, uh, it's always about the character. Um, I mean, I know people talk about, like, plot and, you know, carving out what their novel's going to look like and, you know, and shaping it before they actually start to really think about how their characters will engage and interact and how they'll look and how they'll feel. But for me, the character always comes first. Um, you know, it, it's almost like this this person like appears to me, um, you know, and, and they're there to tell me that they've got a story to share. And right away, I'm not always kind of sure what that story is going to be, but I just know that they want to talk to me. And, you know, I can, I, I can see them fully formed. I know what they look like. Um, I know that, that, that they're maybe troubled or have something to say. Um, and then just gradually, you know, when, once I can kind of fully understand who they are, then the story starts to come in a little bit more. Um, and, and for this novel in particular, um, so it's um, just to give you a little bit of background about it, almost then uh, is a story of twins, as, as Lynn mentioned, uh, Rasslin and Bracken. 
Um, and when they were 12 years old, uh, their mother and father, who they loved really dearly, they had this really idyllic family life, um, and they died in an accident on their 12th birthday. So, um, and they lived in this beautiful house called Ballyno, which they loved and was part of their existence. And, you know, I always think of them as of the place, you know, the home is part of, you know, it's almost part of um, their roots are in it, they are of the house. Um, and they come together on, on uh, their 27th birthday to, well, I'm not gonna tell you what happens, but let's just say that um, they, uh, yeah, a lot of things happen anyway. But listen, see when I'm here, I may as well just like tell you a little bit Rathlin in this house and then um, we can talk a bit more about the character. I'm gonna move forward a wee bit just in case the audio is not great. Rathlin was born in this house, in this bedroom in Ballyno. Memories of her mother live in every cavity of the walls on each thread of carpet, in the lived lines of the creaking floorboards. But it is here on this bed that she feels her mother's presence. That first coming together is tattooed onto its mattress. She's smothering herself in it and the house is bending in, wrapping its arms around her, sheltering her from the fall, because she will fall. She always, always falls. Rathlin is pressing her fingers into coiled springs, their pulse, a connection. She's remembering tasting her mother's blood and her teeth, the stench circling and settling on the back of her throat. She's trying to clear it, but it is clinging to her tonsils, tiny metallic puffs releasing with each <coughs> of her forced coughs, bringing a reminder onto her lips. She's licking the reminiscence greedily, knowing it's all she has left. Bathlin senses the forest behind the window calling her and using her arms as a crane she's raising her neck, watching trees swallowing the hill that's pressing into the horizon. Its shadows are stealing her, but she's a willing traveller all the same, following their inky path, letting her mind wander to the past. Anyway, so that's my Rathlin. And um, throughout the novel, she is driven by, being haunted by the past and, and she almost then you know, goes back, but she always manages to stop herself and her and her brother are about to find out something quite tragic. But anyway, it's her story, Bracken's story, and another character called Ellen, who again is somebody else who came to me um, in a very troubled way and had a story to tell. And they came independently of each other. Um, but, you know, as soon as they both sort of started talking to me as they do, I don't know if other writers are the same. Your characters yes. wake you up in the middle of the night and it's like a radio play. Like, da, 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 and they came together and yeah, that was it. So yeah, very much about characters and then the story building around it. Sorry, Susan, I'm stealing the floor. That's okay, that's fine. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. I've got plenty of time. But, but Margot, you've answered several questions in one go. You've told me what character-driven means, which is the characters mm. drive the plot. And I'm I'm guessing that you don't know how the plot's going to unravel. No, I don't really. I mean, I I just always knew that um, the twins would come together, um, and the house would be at the centre of it, and and their you know whatever happened to their parents would be at the heart of either breaking them or bringing them together. And I think it's really important that they're twins because I mean I'm a twin myself. You know, we talked about twins being in the family, but I think it's a different bond with your twin sibling. And and for me, that um, you know, fear of losing your twin and and not having them part of your life anymore is quite shocking. Um, so I think my my characters, um, you know, had that at the centre of everything that was going as well. So it was really about who they were as people, and then all the rest of the stuff just came came along. <laughs> so you've answered: Is it a character-driven novel? Yes, the definitely. characters definitely take the lead lead you and take you through whatever is going to happen next and next and yeah, next. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, you know, I never have really any, I, I suppose in some ways I do kind of envy people that can say, right, like, right, oh, here's 50 chapters and this is what's going to happen in every one in some ways. But, in you know, in other ways, I really like the fact that my characters kind of do things that I don't expect them to do or, you know, end up, you know, something completely shocking happening in the story that I hadn't anticipated. And really, I mean, it feels like you're sort of saying it's not in your control. And, and to some extent, it's not really because, you know, they're telling me what they're going to do. And sometimes it might feel, oh, that's a little bit out of the character that I thought they were. 
but you know that that tells me more about it being character driven because actually they're the ones in control of what the Definitely. character is yeah. I completely understand that completely sympathize with that I mean that's how I write too so that makes sense to me mm -hmm. um Susan do you relate to that very much so uh, yes yeah. I think I kind of start from a different point or particularly with the dolphin because the original idea came from me driving to work and I used to drive past a pub which was quite a big pub on a very small road and not nothing really around it and you're just thinking oh, I wonder why why there's a pub there why somebody built a pub there and it went on from there really I'm just thinking okay well who would build a pub there so even though the the original idea was the place rather than the character the character really came out of that initial idea and what would make somebody build such a pub and then obviously the idea grew and grew and like you Margot I wrote started writing it and I didn't know what was going to happen at all um mm -hmm. and I mean I didn't even know I started writing it thinking the whole book was going to be about my main character Larry and then suddenly right I thought okay actually I'm not going to do him I'm going to introduce his daughter Joni but she's this is you know several years later and that wasn't intentional um she just appeared as well um so yeah I mean that's, it's like life isn't it you don't know what's going to happen you you start mm -hmm. writing something and I think because none of us know what's going to happen next week tomorrow it's the same with your characters if they're also in that position like you say I, I just don't like the idea of plotting out a book and knowing exactly what's going to happen there's no there's no joy in writing that for me. Um, in fact, it just makes me stop writing if I know too much, I think. Um, so it's discovering as you go along, I think, what the characters want, what, they, what they're capable of, um, and then just making them work together with the, with the plot, I think. Does it bring not having your post-its all over the wall with exactly where you're going chapter by chapter, as I know some writers do. I don't know how they do, but they do. Mm. Does it give you a sense of insecurity ever, Susan? That Do you ever um, have days where you think, oh, I don't, I'm not sure what's going to happen because they've not told me what's going to happen next? Or does it keep rolling? Um, how, how does it feel as you um, go along with this kind of writing? Well, quite often I feel like <laughs> getting blood out of a stone, to be honest. <laughs> um, I wish it was rolling along, but um, I think a lot of it is just, it is just working out as you go along. Some of it is, some days are very tortuous, I think, but you just cannot get over the next little hurdle. And sometimes it can be as small as making somebody leave the room, I find. <laughs> and you know, once they get out of the room, you can move on, but you just can't get them to get out of the room, <laughs> which sounds ridiculous, I know, but somehow I just can't find the words. Um, but yeah, and, and I think having all those, if I had all those post-it notes, it yeah, I would find that stultifying, yeah. uh, I think. Restricting. Yeah, and then because you've got to conform then, haven't you? You haven't got any leeway to, for your characters to do, like you said, Margot, to do what they want to do. You're imposing something on them, which just doesn't work, I don't think. Mm. But it also suggests the confidence. And, and this is your first novel, Susan. I think you have to have a certain confidence in yourself to go with the characters rather than the post-its. Um, Maybe. And trust. There's a lot of trust. Yes. Yeah. Um, I suppose. I suppose so. Yes. I mean, I hadn't written a novel before, so I didn't know how to do it. So I just did what <laughs> what, what came, what seemed to come to me, um, and I think it worked. I think it worked. And I, and well, I'm working on another novel at the moment, which is slightly more thought out in terms of plot I would say but again the characters in that have have very much dictated how it happens and when things happen and what they do in the meantime so um yeah I think uh, yeah character very much is the key part of it and I don't think anybody wants to read a book that hasn't got characters that they're not invested in and aren't believable mm. however great the plot might be mm. it's it's not well, obviously there are books that are purely plot, really, but um, which are can be very successful. But 
I think if you want to really get into a book, you've got to believe in those characters, haven't you? And both of you, are those characters, when they start talking to you, um, is it, I mean, Margot, you've already said it's oral and visual. You mm. hear them, you see them yes. as well. Yes, are very they, annoyingly. <laughs> <laughs> are, they, are they fully formed? Or do um, they develop as you write? Or is that not a, yes? No, no I think they do develop because, um, because they do unexpected things and, and, you know, there's twists and turns that you hadn't anticipated. So as individuals, they do develop because maybe their character changes. Um, but, you know, I can see them and I can see, it's very visual for me writing. You yeah. know, every single word, I can see it. Um, so that can be quite, I think writing's really hard, right? I mean, it really is. It doesn't matter if your characters are like going off like a train and they've got an amazing story and you're trying to keep up with them. Um, you know, it's just, it's hard. It's, it's hard work to chug along with them because, and I think because I am so visual and the way I write, in some ways, I think that maybe slows me down a little bit because there's so much going on yeah. and there's so much to get on the page. And I know a lot of that, you know, obviously like gets paired back and, and gets, you've edited with me Lynn <laughs> a lot has to go um you know but I've got to like for me personally writing I have to like have that scene I have to I mean I guess it, it's a bit like because I, I make films I guess as well so and and although it although it's um, not fiction they're very much character driven that is the heart of them you know they're character yeah. driven stories you know so I guess I'm kind of doing a similar thing you know I'll lay down a version of a film which is like twice as long as it needs to be and then pair it back and, and writing is, is a bit like that. So I've even completely forgotten what you asked me anyway. I'm just rabbiting <laughs> on like I do. Just tell me to be quiet. <laughs> okay, oh, Margot. See, I'm Let like me... one of my characters. I'm off. <laughs> I want to ask you the obvious question. You can just shout me down now. How much of your characters is drawn from you, yourself? and your own experiences and do you ever have a character in one of your novels who is totally out with anything that you've done experience know about okay let me go um, back to susan first um because you have a quite a big cast there susan and you have you have larry who i find hugely sympathetic i've i've said this to you over and over this gay man in 1937 who just has to suppress everything that he feels and wants and desires. And you do it beautifully. You, you do it with such truth and sensitivity. And I'm thinking, how is Susan engaged with this character? And also, I mean, you sent me a story recently about the man going to the optician. And oh, that yeah. was another that was another gay man. <laughs> I don't know why suddenly I've got, got into this, but um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, let, let me go back to the question, which which clearly the answer's no to. Um, mm. What do you draw on from yourself, your your life, your your experiences? I think I mean I think characters both you can have any kind of character but it's all filtered through your own experience it has to be I think if you're going to make them as I said before believable characters I mean if you're writing sci-fi or fantasy obviously things are going to happen that you can't possibly have experienced yourself but I think you know their thoughts their feelings all those have to come somehow from inside you um even if they are filtered into very different circumstances and I'm sure we've all you know wanted things we can't have <laughs> um in life so as Harry, as um, Larry does though his is obviously a quite a, a very very significant thing um and with the other characters I mean if I, I could say a little bit about the book now or as you've you've already said it's, it's three generations of one family so Joni Larry's daughter after the war is kind of stuck in the pub. It's post-war austerity, money's tight, times are hard. Um, there's really not very much going on. And she just feels, she's just completely trapped by her circumstances. But those 
frustrations of not being able to do what you want to do, not being able to go out into the world and live your life. I mean, I think every teenager's probably felt that at some point. Again, not in those circumstances, but it's something I can certainly relate to in you know my teenage years, um, not being able to live what you the life you want you want to lead. Um, so I do feel, yes, it's all got to come through you somehow, and and then it comes out in a different form. I think that's a very very good account of what we as writers should do with our characters which is take emotions that we understand and then you translate them, you, you remove them several notches from yourself and you plant them in other characters. So they're removed from you, but there's something about them that you can relate to and that you can present very truthfully. And I think you explained that really well. So even though you're not Larry, you understand uh, the feelings that he's felt in, in different contexts. And I think where you find lesser writers, they're not making those transitions enough that the characters stand on their own two feet and are themselves, they're the author, undisguised, not enough disguised. So yeah. When, I, when I'm reading submissions, I'm looking for characters that really are self-sufficient, independent, apart from the writer. And I don't always see that. I don't always hear that. Uh, I'm, I'm often reading about the author. So I, mean, I think that what you've said is, is very good. It, it's yeah. um, it's I think, several um, times removed, isn't it? It is, yeah. And I think the, the classic thing is that your first novel is autobiographical, isn't it? Yes. So many people do that. And actually, that's I think that's one of the reasons why I made him a man. I set it in the 1930s. I made him gay and I made him live in this, you know, tiny place and made him a builder. I thought it's definitely not autobiographical. No one can accuse me of that. <laughs> that was one of my, my thinkings behind it, I think. But yeah, is yeah, it, hopefully it, the emotions come through. And... Is this a good moment to just read a bit about yes. Larry, Susan? Yeah. And then I'll come um, back to Margot and ask her the same, yeah. the same question. So this section is. Um, Larry's had this failed gay encounter where he just couldn't even admit to himself that that's what he wanted and he's been trying to forget it but he's come across this was obviously um, in a fishing boat in the sea and he's come across near where he lives a piece of land which is just he said this land comes in waves like a kind of frozen sea and it's just brought back all those feelings about the fishing boat, the dolphin, um, and what happened there. And this, there's just been an accident with his son when he's back home. Rain spilled suddenly out of the dark. He locked up the shed and slowly went back towards the house. As he reached the back step, something in the way the wind pushed at him reminded him of the morning standing on top of the hill. He paused for a moment, remembering how the land was sea green, the sweep and the swell of it. Then his old vision of the sea returned, flooding through him like a riptide and mixed now with the memory of the dolphin and the feel of Will's hand on his arm. It was so sudden, so powerful, he had to grab hold of the door handle to stop himself collapsing onto the step. He'd thought all that was done with, but here it was back again and he couldn't even tell if it gave him pleasure or pain. He blinked hard and opened the door, welcoming the light and warmth of the kitchen. If all this wasn't done with, if it didn't go away, what was he going to do? There was no way to live with it, no way to reconcile it with Rosemary, with Joni, with Roy. The possibility of giving into it, of leaving the life he had and choosing a new one, appeared only for a moment before it evaporated again. So many barriers to cross, so much hurt and shame to endure for him and others. He rubbed his temples and stared at the grain of the pine table, following with his finger the knots and whirls that wound round and round, leading nowhere. Poor old Larry. <laughs> Thank you. But he's Can strong. I just say that I yes. read that book, everyone, and it's wonderful. I had um, a real treat in reading it recently before it comes out. So, um, yeah, I love it, and I think everyone else will too. So, get by it. Thank you. Let's <laughs> <Yes>, do. <laughs> Can I go back to that same question then? How much of Margot is in, um, I think in the characters, so and almost then, I mean, the twins 
obviously you understand what it is to be a twin yeah. all the twins in your family go on you carry on what else I mean I think what Susan said is, is really important about like you know feeling that emotion and and you know maybe not necessarily having direct experience but you know being able to um see a similar situation and and maybe reflect that in a different way but um I think definitely for almost saying um the fact that I am a twin so I do understand that um that bond I understand that that passion so I was writing from a specific place which maybe isn't always the case you know my own experience I mean obviously I can't remember my birth but I've heard so many stories about it so there is a scene in in the book where um you know we we go back and look at when the twins were born and it very much establishes who their characters are and I think there's a little bit of that in me and my twin you know we are sort of different well one he's a boy you know poor soul god bless him it's a shame it's not his fault but um he's a boy and you know that the characters are very different in terms of how their mother sees them immediately I mean she's um you know the daughter is described as more bird-like and you know the sense that you know there's movement in her but describes the son as you know being like a freshly dug rock you know very different personalities that are in green very much from the start and I think there is a little bit of that in myself and my twin um but I think I always write about people that um I feel like I would know you know like I couldn't write about middle class, like upper class people. You know, my 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 um my writing is all was very much rooted in working class people or people who have been working class and maybe you know kind of moved up uh, via occupation or whatever. But they're never truly middle class. They're really always all of that that different generation. You know that the um different kind of upbringing. Um. So yeah, it, it's 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 definitely experiences there. I think I wouldn't feel terribly authentic if I was writing um a character who I'd never spent time with you know I know people like Ellen you know I know people who have been brought up in you know that desperation that sense of abandonment um you know growing up in, in poverty and you know there's all these different elements of Ellen and and you know having that um you know she's hard she's tough um, she's a bit scary but you know all she's actually doing is fighting for her love she's fighting for the person who she loves so dearly and I think I can see that in a lot of people I might not necessarily know Ellen but you know that fire and I mean definitely that fire I think I can recognize that in myself um yeah so there's little bits and pieces but um yeah I I have to I have to know them. I mean, I think what you did with Larry, Susan, is amazing because um, even when I was writing back and um, his character, I've got a twin brother, so why should I be feel like anxious about describing him and you know, like his mannerisms and stuff? Because I've lived that experience. Like I know men, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I've got brothers, I've got a father, um, but yeah. So I think what you did with Larry is just amazing. Sorry, um, and. Yeah, so it was very clever of you to be able to um, draw him in such a strong way that he's very, very believable. You know, like I, I, I would meet Larry in the pub and I would be like, yeah, yeah, he's a real person. You know, sometimes I think if you're, you can write a character and if you're not confident in knowing them and understanding them, you know, they're just thin, you know, they're one dimensional. Everybody that I write has to have, has to be three dimensional. If I can't see them, then you know, like, uh, I know my book. Yeah, I mean, your, your <laughs> characters come over brilliantly well, I think, um, just really strong. And I, I was really interested in your use um, when you're, you're writing in their accent as well, aren't you? You're yes. writing in, in which I think gives them an extra dimension really, because you, I mean, I'm not Scottish obviously, but so I'm reading these things and sounding out in my head. Um, and I think it just brings another element to them and another, um b believable aspect to them I think yeah I think that's really important to me as well and that's again goes back to the fact that these characters are real people you know I am visualizing them and hearing them I can hear them talking so when I hear them talking and they're talking in a particular accent if I was to try and write that in like normal English it just wouldn't feel like my person right you yeah. know so yeah I just wouldn't I, I, I know and I know it's problematic you know, I know that um, 
thankfully Lynn liked it but I know a lot of publishers just don't want to listen to that kind yeah. of language I think yeah. they just really want to have that and I, I know that in my first novel which is very Glaswegian even my Virgin Mary is Glaswegian in it um, <laughs> but but in early uh, days of that novel um, when Penguin Scot Scotland were in operation um, they were really interested in that novel but they did say that I would have to like um, you know change that Glaswegian right stuff into like plain English and I was like can't do that because it loses everything that it has so yeah it's very much part and I know like I know people have said to me before I couldn't read that because you know I can't okay. I can't hear that voice but yeah you know, but it, for you to have written it in any other way wouldn't have been authentic and and what you're saying is and this is one of the strengths of almost then is the characters as you've just said belong to a particular mm. layer in society it's that place with the you know the council blocks and the the estates and, and yeah. messy messy outsides and that's where you're comfortable and that's good because you can bring us those characters which maybe other readers don't have experience of and I hear what you're saying that how can you write about someone from a background that you have no knowledge or experience of mm. and in your book the I've forgotten their names Francis and there's the lovely elderly couple Frank and Francis yeah <laughs> yeah they come from that background they've come from a very they've come from a, an impoverished restricted background and they give love and kindness and care to I wondered where they came from so I think it's that kind of notion of, um, for me, um, in my experience, like the people that I've grown up around, the working class characters, are had quite a strong influence on me. And they are these tough kind of characters that maybe seem a bit loud and, you know, a bit brash, but they've got hearts of gold, you know. I mean, obviously not everybody in the, in the planet, but, you know, the people that I have got experience with have been really good, kind-hearted people. And, um, you know, I grew up in a, in a housing scheme and, you know, it was very much the community, uh, all the neighbours, like it was like, you know, you didn't have your own personal space at all. <laughs> like <laughs> neighbours were in and out all the time and that's just the way it was. And there was all these different characters and, you know, I think about all these people in the street and think, wow, all of them were like really incredible people. And I think Frank and Francis are, are kind of, um, you know, a kind of mixture of all these different people. Yeah. But the, the really strong thing about them, obviously, is that kind of love and protection. Yes. Um, that they offer to Rathlin because, you know, she's been without her parents since she mm. was 12. She has a really hard time after that. Um, you know, the grandfather. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to go into too much detail to give Ed's in the way, but you know, she ends up separated from her twin brother growing up in the city. And he ends up staying um, where they were born in Ballyno. Um, so she has a different perspective in life. She kind of embodies all that kind of working class toughness. Um, and, you know, the, the, you know, maybe not hiding their emotions and things. Um, and that's all part of just my experiences of, of people mm -hmm. that I, I know and, and love and have been brought up around. Mm. Yeah. I think you're a good advert for your novel. <laughs> and the way you, you are, the way you describe it, it helps us know oh, you. Why, why you've written it, how you've written it. And you're drawing on mm -hmm. your own upbringing and childhood and background, all those people that say in and out the houses all the time. How could you write about anything else? So mm. yeah, that's it. Such an influence on my life. Mm. Okay, let's move on. We're supposed to be talking about difficult characters, but we've been roaming all over the place, <laughs> which is great about <laughs> characters in general. But going back to how do you how do you put into a novel someone who perhaps if you met them you wouldn't like, perhaps if you meet them in a novel you don't like. I don't really like Rosemary Susan, no. and yet, mm -hmm. but she's essential to the of the story yeah, and, and yeah. the other characters so how do you write a, a, an unpleasant character and why and what's her role and how yeah. did you do it I, I, do you know I can't think why I made her so awful <laughs> <laughs> I mean it, it worked with Larry and maybe because of all his um his guilt and doubts and everything um it needed to have somebody really, really strong as a sort of counterbalance to him. 
and I, I can maybe read a little bit that just kind of shows you why she's the way she is yeah. um, and just find it which doesn't sort of take away from how appalling she behaves to everybody so um Larry and Rosemary are in a pub which is really not the place where Rosemary wants to be because it's not respectable that's her kind of motto in life it has to be respectable mm. but it's there's a storm and sleet outside so they've had to go so he finished his own drink and went up to the bar the whiskey was unfurling inside him his cheeks reddening in its warmth he looked over at Rosemary sitting closed and narrow in her chair her gaze fixed on the table she didn't know how to be happy that was the trouble she set so many conditions on it that it would never happen. Larry sighed, and there was so much pleasure to be had from a pub, he thought. Not just the drink, but the conversation, the company, the belonging. He listened now to the noise around him, the talk of football and work, the jokes and banter, the laughter of men at ease with each other. There wasn't a better place to be. He made his way back to the table, setting Rosemary's drink in front of her. She took a sip of brandy and suddenly, leads, <coughs> suddenly leaned towards him. I never came out on a Saturday night when I was that age, she said, gesturing to the girl on the next table. Mother would never have allowed it. Larry watched as the girl took a long drink of beer, then smiled across at him. He looked away quickly. Times do change, don't they? I didn't complain, though, not once. I did my duty. He nodded, half listening. <coughs> Poor mother. Rosemary's voice cracked as tears gathered in her eyes. She didn't get an easy time of it. He watched her dab at her eyes, feeling both pity and resentment. Her mother had dominated her, filled with ideas of what her life should be. The husband, the home, the children, all struck from a preordained mould. Rosemary had not once questioned, questioned whether this was the right thing to do, even when it was clear as glass that reality would never live up to her expectations. No wonder she was unhappy. And I, th I think that's kind of the key to why Rosemary is so bitter and so disappointed in life. It's just not what she thinks should have happened mm. and Larry isn't the husband she thinks she should have had and their marriage is really botched from the start when it's kind of engineered by her mother so um yeah there's no hope for them really <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a terribly sad portrait of a marriage it's it, it, it is it's, heart, it, it's heartbreaking yeah well and darkness um darkness in almost then it yeah, is a dark I mean, that's, novel, isn't it? Which is a dark. Yeah, no, definitely, it's a dark novel. I mean, I think. Um, well, I hope when people are reading it, that they feel that they're edging towards something that's quite dark and quite sinister, and 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 when they do find it, will be quite shocking. Um, but in terms of dark characters, um, Rathlin and Bracken's grandfather is a particularly dark character, and there's nothing about him you're going to find likable. I mean, he's he's a bit like Rosemary, you know. There's uh, there's nothing there that I want anyone to to find uh, any goodness in. Um, you know, he's playing that specific role, um, and and it's part of what has haunted um, the twins and um, and even Ellen to a certain extent. Uh, Ellen, um, she did start out in my mind and in my vision as being a particularly unlikable and and dark character. Um, but she kind of fought her way to the front and like, you know, she mm. showed her good side and um, she emerged as something different. I mean, there is obviously, um, you know, there is a sense of, of her and, you know, she is feisty and, and, and she is trying to sell um, Rathlin and Bracken's home from under them. And, and even though she loves Bracken, um, you know, she's, she's, not, she's not going to not do it because of her love for him. You know, she has got this kind of nasty streak in her and, um, but that's a product of who she is. It's a product of her upbringing. It's a product of the fact that, you know, her parents went out one day and, and she never saw them again, you know, and she was just a small child at the time. Um, but I think that that's the case in a lot of people who maybe um, on the surface aren't particularly likable, you know, that they've got this kind of like sadness burning inside them that, yeah. um, that makes them react to situations in a certain way and, and I think that's certainly the case. Can I read you a wee bit of Ellen, um, yes. actually? Um, so this is her um, looking at Rathlin. Um, so there, there's a couple of scenes when, when each of them are 
taken some time to actually look at the other. I mean, they hate each other, these two girls. They really do. Um, you know, and, and it's all to do with because they both want the love of Bracken, Bracken all to themselves. But Ellen's um, kind of looking at Rathlin and, and really seen her and she's taken this opportunity. Rathlin's body is in an awkward position, yet somehow she is consumed by sleep. She is slumped in a high back chair that has been pulled close to the bed. Her right arm is resting on the bed and her head is nestling on her other forearm. Her knees are bent and her feet part tightly around one mahogany leg. Ellen thinks it looks weird, like her legs are an unwelcome intrusion. Her hair really is as black as black can be. Ellen is talking to herself, taking advantage of Rathlin's stillness to examine her carefully. She's used to seeing her on the move, her limbs flailing as if she's on the verge of an attack. She looks closely, following the arch of Rathlin's back her hair camouflaging any suggestion of her spine. Definitely a raven. Rathlin stirs a little when her hair lifts and falls as if she were preparing to take flight. Impressive, thinks Ellen. She steps gently from her chair and goes around to the other side, getting a better view of Rathlin from the west, where one side of her face is visible. Her cheek is high and pronounced. Her nose is long and thin. Ellen's bending over it, pulling back when she's unable to find any bumps. So what? She's got a good nose. It doesn't make her God's gift. So that's the Ellen, what she thinks of Rathlin. So there's this like, and this is a particular point in the book where maybe they're starting to have a little bit of affection for one another because, you know, something quite tragic has happened and it's kind of brought them in a, a different place. Um, but still you know even though there's a softness they're still quite bitchy about each other but that's the characters of who they are they're, they're both very much protecting themselves and you know they've got that kind of steely exterior and they don't really want to um to soften too much and reveal their true self mm -hmm. and what you do with ellen margo is make her multi-layered that is a bit what you yes. just said you start off with her as perhaps a bit too dimensional hard as nails but she unfolds and, and like a flower, yeah. you see a soft centre. Your, your characters are complex. They're, they are, oh, aren't they? Aren't what they? does that say about my brain, honestly? <laughs> um, but yeah, so Ellen is that kind of, and that's a lovely way to describe her. Um, you know, we are sort of like revealing more and more about her. And she's doing that. And so Ellen, like, hears voices. Um, you know, she almost has these conversations going on in her head all the time. And I think to a certain extent, a lot of people do, you know, like, you know, like you say something to me and then in my head, I'm going, right, okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but Ellen does that in a, a you know, yes. a really dynamic way. It's part of her personality, it's part of who she is. And, and she does it outwardly in the novel, you know, she really kind of brings all this to play and um, she's very complex. And, you know, I just ended up really liking her, God bless her. I wanted her to I wanted her to have a happy ending and I didn't know if she was going to have a happy ending and I'm not going to let you know if she does <laughs> no, I've read it yet. <laughs> but you know um yeah I let her go in the direction she wanted to go and I was pleased with then how she evolved <laughs> I think everyone listening in here must be picking up how immersed you are in the characters that you've created these are no quick superficial on the surface people that skim across the surface of the novel they're complex they're difficult they're real and I hear from both of you that you go right down into them and that, that's why the novel works so well it's partly why I mean it's good plot as well good writing as well but the characters live and breathe on on the pages and that, that's a tremendous achievement and not every writer can do that. So let, let me ask you something really silly before I hand over to Kate in case there are some questions. I want to ask you how you come up with the names for your characters and do you agonise over what they're called? <laughs> well, I think mine, mine were more or less plucked from thin air, but they? They, but they somehow had to feel right. They somehow had, and you know, if they don't fit, then it just the whole thing just feels very uncomfortable um so did you try to... several did, um, did, did you 
did, did they roll? A, did you try several before you settled on? I think Larry was always Larry. Was he Larry? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the others came quite quickly, I think. And I think once I'd kind of thought of what the, like Rosemary's personality, Rosemary just yes. seemed to fit very much with that. Um, though I'm really regretting that they all end in Y. Oh, I haven't even Larry, seen that. Larry and Lottie and Joni yeah. and Rosemary. <laughs> oh, no, no, I haven't y. even <laughs> seen that. Mm. Or heard it. Should have had a bit of variety there, I think. <laughs> Is it the same, Margot? Well, I mean, my characters have got um, names that uh, mean something to me. So, um, yeah. Rathlin, um Rathlin Island is where my yeah. father's from, where I have a home um, where I feel is my sort of spiritual home. Um, so she's, I mean, I, I feel that my characters really are, as I mentioned, of the land and of the sea and, and of their environment. So there is that kind of island theme there going on, yeah. Rathlin and her mother's called Sky and uh, Barra is um, Ellen's son. Uh, and, and Bracken is actually um, related to a whirlpool that's off uh, the coast of Rathlin. So they're all interconnected in that kind of way. And um, I'm kind of really driven by the sea. And I know there's lots of references to the sea as well. And in your uh, novel, Susan, which was really yeah. interesting yeah. to see that in yourself as well. So yeah, um, yeah so the characters were all, all very personal to me. And um, Ellen just appeared as Ellen, you know? She, she was just Ellen. She, she never... <laughs> allowed herself to be anything else um and and Frank and Francis were in Francis came first and then like I just like because they're so cute and sweet and just really beautiful kind people I like that kind of cuteness of um him being Frank so he stuck mm -hmm. thank you Kate um can I bring you in I've got more questions but there may be questions from the audience we should we can yes. turn to Hello. Hello. Um, Are you there? <laughs> <laughs> I am here. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, now is the time. Um, if you just drop them in the chat box, that'd be great. Um, yeah, it's been a really interesting talk. Thank you so much. It's been really nice to hear like about how how you came up with the ideas for your characters and yeah, really interesting um thank you yeah thank you so i can see a, a a question in the chat box um was it challenging to write characters from three different points of view and i don't think it was because they're chronological really so um we've got one starting in the 1930s another one in the late 1940s one in the late 1960s so i think um they almost I don't, it didn't it didn't seem to be too much of a problem I don't think um and well what happens to Larry there was no way that his he could sustain the rest of the book anyway uh so obviously I needed to move on and and I like the idea that Joni's in the first section with Larry and then she moves on to her own um timeline and then Lottie moves on to her own timeline but they're all connected so it's, it's not jumping wildly from com to completely different um people and completely different environments and i think that probably helps so kind of as one character was was formed within each of the section the characters were formed within the sections sort of preceding them or the timeline preceding them if that makes sense <laughs> completely i'm i'm like i just can't write a linear story i just can't do it I think I, I can't do it when I'm making films either. I, I have to like, I think it's just the way, and I don't know if everybody's brain works like this. So if I sound like a little bit insane, like apologies in advance, but I feel as if like you think about one thing and then that thought carries you on to something else. And then that thought carries you on to something else, but they're all connected, but they don't necessarily flow in order. Mm. So um, I think what you did with um, the dolphin season was really clever in the way that you've managed to, to make that all flow, but not necessarily, I and mean, it's not linear because you're going from 38 to 60 and mm. 70s and back and forward, and but it, it doesn't jar. And um, I like that, uh, you know, I like, I think it challenges us as readers. You know, I, I feel as if like, you don't want things to be too easy for people. You want to, to be invested in the story. And yeah. if you're just laying it all out for them on a plate, then, you know, maybe that's, um, you know, cause there's got to be 
I always find that when you read a book and then you finish that book and you put it down, like you've left a part of yourself in it. That's why I don't like giving my books away. Like I like keeping them because I feel like I feel like if somebody else is opening it, I'm going to pop out because like there's a little bit of myself in it. Um, yeah. Anyway, there I go again talking nonsense. Yeah, actually, I was going to say, I actually wrote the book chronologically. So I wrote all oh. the Larry and then Joni and then Lottie and then put them together. Oh, um, oh right. And, which I think Doesn't... would have been quite Ooh, hard. I not know. Right. Well, that's mm. good. <laughs> you do it so well, Susan. I, I mean, it's like this. It's all beautifully knitted together. And there are books that go back and forth where you can get, I get quite confused as the way we are but never confused with your book you yeah. knit it so well yeah right. okay over to you Kate again um yeah so you found another question from Emily um do you have a character that seems to follow you in all of your writing and makes repeated appearances <laughs> um I think there's not so much a character but a sense of a particular type of person perhaps I mean like I'm uh, when I write you know I know that you know women's voices are so hugely neglected all the time everywhere in every context and every environment um, and I know that things are getting better so I always like want to have characters that I know just never had the opportunity to have their voice heard so rather than it being a specific character I think there's definitely elements of characters that I'll never I'll never like let them go I think they'll always come with me there's always that um I just feel like I've got a like a responsibility um you know when you're when you're doing something that's public and it's on a platform that you know that you're doing it that you know carries some weight as well and you know I just want women to feel that they can open a book that I've written and you know if they're not seeing themselves they're seeing you know somebody in their family or a friend or you know somebody that um you know that they're seeing that oh wow that's really lovely that that person has been represented so it's it's more like that for me to be honest do you want to add anything to that Susan um well actually interestingly the book I'm working on has also got a not particularly likable female character oh, no. <laughs> not as bad as Rosemary I don't think but um definitely not um not particularly likable so that maybe that's my theme <laughs> <laughs> um okay and we've had another question from Jessica um she says thank you um I have loved the conversation this evening um Margot in, in Almost Then the house is like one of the characters and although I haven't yet read your book Susan I'm thinking the pub might also be like a character do either mm. of you want to say anything about this and how you develop the central buildings as characters it's a really interesting one mm. I'll let you go first Susan okay um yeah I think the pub definitely is almost a character because Larry builds it as a form of self-expression it's everything he can't do in his own life he makes into this magnificent place that's not like any other pub. And I mean, I've, I've got kind of ideas of it in my mind, but it's a kind of beautiful art deco building like nothing else around. And it's somewhere where he can be himself. Um, so while it hasn't got a character, it, it's it's not a character itself, but it's definitely a, a facet of Larry's character um, that yeah, has no other outlet. So it, it is very important, yeah. Um, yeah, um, thanks Jessica. Yeah, definitely and almost then. In fact, there's even um, a very lovely drawing in the book um, of um, the houses, they are central to it. Um, it, it. The reason it's a character is because it's essentially part of who Rathlin and Bracken are. It's where they were born, it's where they had the happiest memories, it's where they were shaped um, by their parents and, and it's almost like the house is kind of creaking with them, you know, it moves when they move, um, you know, when they pass in the corridor, it kind of almost gasps because they're part and ways. It really is part of the fabric of um, their existence. And yeah, really important to me that that came across. Well, that's a really good question. And I didn't raise that, that the characters in the book are also buildings for both of you. Mm. Yeah. Thank mm. you, whoever sent that one in. <laughs> Um, is 
so we haven't had any other questions come in. Um, is there any last thing you want to add, Lynn? I was going to ask them who their favourite character is of all. Do you have a favourite character? Um, I think mine is Joni. Um, Joni? Yeah, I think possibly she's the one most similar to me. Um, but I, I, I like the idea of her. She's very put upon. She's like all the others trapped by circumstances. She has a okay. disaster happens, but she makes the best of it and things actually come right in the end. She's a lot stronger than um, than she seems. And I like that. Margot, favourite one? Um, maybe not so much favourite, but the one that I was rooting for, I think, yeah. was Bracken, because I feel that he was at the centre of everything. Yeah. Um, and he had gone through such a lot um, in his childhood and he doesn't really have the opportunity to have a voice in the way that the other do because they're so loud and you know they steal every scene and um, so he doesn't really get that opportunity but I was really rooting for him to have a happy ending but I'm not telling you what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I could be lying, I could be lying. Don't <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so I think we'll leave it there then if no one else has any questions. Um, thank you so much for everyone for attending and thank you, Lynn, thank you to our speakers, Margot and Susan, for a really interesting and insightful talk. Um, just wanted to let everyone know that we're running these events on a regular basis, so please keep an eye out on um, our social media pages to stay up to date. Um, we also, um, I've made a feedback form, so um, if you have five minutes, it would be amazing if you could just let us know your opinion on our events, whether this is the first one you've attended or if you've attended them all. Um, we really value your feedback. Um, and yeah, I think that's everything. Um, thank no, you very not much. Quite. No, no, not quite. <laughs> I have one more thing to say. With tears in my eyes, I'm, I want to say, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Kate and goodbye, because Kate's been with, with us for a year and she's been absolutely amazing. She, she's done all these events. She is calm, competent, brilliant. And when I'm having a big flap, <laughs> there's Kate saying it's fine. I can do it. It'll all work. <laughs> I'll set it up. Kate, you have been a wonderful intern, far more than an intern I mean you've been an assistant <laughs> and you've been with us a long time Kate has um proper paid job in publishing hooray yay congratulations thank you <laughs> thank you Kate for all that you've done we're going to miss you a lot and good luck with what oh, you do in the so future much, it's been such a great experience and I will miss you a lot <laughs> no, we will miss you we will miss you <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you all. Thank you, Margot. Thank you, Susan. And uh, that's all for now. Till the next one. Thank okay. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.